so you're probably all hungry, right? <laughs> Let's talk about food. It's one of my favorite things. And to get in the mood, I'd like you all to think about a favorite home-cooked meal, okay? It can be sweet or savory. I'm going to think about my Grandma Lillian's brisket. This is my family having it over a holiday meal. And the interesting thing is we all love food, right? But we don't all love cooking. Uh, cooking as a life skill is less and less valued. There's a million other ways to get food prepared for you by other people. Fast food, delivery, apps. You can get everything brought to you now. Uh, and let's face it, cooking's a chore. It's messy. There's cleanup. It's annoying to plan meals, boring to do the shop. Maybe you've got picky kids. Maybe there's no good grocery near where you live. Uh, maybe you only have a hot plate to cook on. Or maybe you're like me. You like the special occasion meals, right? So when I cook my Grandma Lillian's brisket, it's four and a half hours. That is, that's a long <laughs> recipe. Um, and I, but I love it. I love to read uh, through her recipe. She had this little trick of adding ginger snap cookies at the end to thicken the gravy. And I think about her as I do that recipe. But daily meals, you know, we all could do without that. And it does make me wonder if cooking is even relevant anymore. So as a food designer, I've gotten to go around the world talking to people about food. Um, their likes, dislikes, needs, desires. And in my travels, I've learned some pretty interesting things. One I wanted to share with you that I learned in Japan is this idea about mother's taste. And what is mother's taste? Well, mother's taste is really about the flavors of home cooking and how they imprint on your family. So if, for example, you're going to feed your child their first tomato, you better pick a really good juicy one. It better be the best tomato you can find because your child is going to remember that tomato, right? It's going to determine partly whether they enjoy tomatoes. And I thought that was a really cool way to understand the foods that we grow to like and dislike. The other thing I've seen in my research is a really exciting uh, push by people for healthier food. They're really demanding healthier food. Um, and in that push, uh, they're looking for better solutions, right? They're starting to recognize that good food is good medicine. It's good for you. So often, what I'm designing for is the gap between the healthy food that they know they want and the skills that can't quite get them there. So food really matters, but we also know food is making us sick. This number, 86 million Americans, this is the number of Americans that are estimated to be pre-diabetic. So that's one in three, okay? So I can't quite see you out there, but look to your neighbor on the left and your neighbor on the right and yourself. It's likely one of you is pre-diabetic. And if that's not scary enough, nine out of 10 people don't know they're pre-diabetic, okay? So pre-diabetes leads to, often leads to type two diabetes and that can lead to things like heart disease, stroke, blindness, kidney failure. And I am one of those 86 million Americans. I was diagnosed as pre-diabetic two years ago. And let me tell you what a shock that was, <laughs> right? I'm a Northern California foodie. I eat kale. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really had a self-image as this healthy person who occasionally indulged. But what I learned was that I was a very indulgent eater who occasionally chose something healthy. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? Yeah, so uh, the key here for me was, you know, what to do with that knowledge. Because we all think we're the exceptions, right? We never like to think of ourselves as the center of the bell curve. What happened was my doctor said I need to lose weight and exercise, and he sent me to a nutritionist. Uh, the nutritionist showed me some plastic bowls of food. She told me that I should only have this much protein and made a fist. And this much cheese. That's like an inch cube, which for me, like, that's, that's nothing. That's a crumb. 
<laughs> uh, it was a long list of don'ts. It was all about deprivation and restriction, um, and it was depressing. So in my work, I use this approach, design thinking, and I decided in this moment to turn that on myself and try to design my way out of this. Um, what is design thinking? Design thinking is about getting inspired by people and experiences. Uh, it's about being generative and optimistic and about creating experiments and prototypes and trying them out in the world. And so knowing deprivation and don'ts was not going to work for me. I, I needed to find a different way in to a new relationship with healthy food. And I want to share three of those experiences or, or prototypes with you, experiments. One is really around extreme, an extreme behavior. And that's meant to inspire me. Another one is around just relearning some basic skills. And the last one is about just getting smarter, right? Just learning a little bit more about nutrition. So the first one, let's go to the wilds of Northern California. This is Point Reyes National Seashore. I'm with my friend Eve. We are foraging. It is raining, it's cold, we have big boots on. We're bushwhacking through brambles. There's poison oak everywhere. You can see the look on my face. I'm not too convinced by all of this. <laughs> uh, and I definitely don't think we're going to find dinner here. Um, but Eve is also a mindfulness expert. She's worked with the Dalai Lama. She's taught uh, meditation workshops around the world. So my fantasy of this extreme experience is that she is going to use all of those Jedi mindfulness skills on me, that I'm going to become enlightened about food. I'm going to lose my attachment to cheese and salami. <laughs> I am going to eat slowly and deliberately. I'm going to be happy with a small bowl of raw native plants. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Didn't quite happen. I di it was... So exciting, it was a super thrill. We did come back with some really cool plants I didn't know you could eat, and trust me, don't just go out and eat stuff now. You have to go with someone who knows what they're doing. But we came home with a basket full of miner's lettuce, delicious, peppery garlic flowers, and stinging nettles. So uh, stinging nettles, literally, if like any of it touches even the tiniest bit of your skin, you have like a burning sting for hours, it's terrible. So anyway, this is me going off the deep end. I'm cooking in my gardening gloves because <laughs> I have my stinging nettles to work with. Um, I decided to make fresh pasta to go with the stinging nettles. This was like hours and hours in the kitchen. By the time I served my family, it was 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> I was exhausted. They thought it was awesome. I was <laughs> totally exhausted. Um, and the interesting thing was that the big learning I took away from it is that grocery stores are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> grocery stores could take some inspiration from foraging because, you know, it gets a little boring in there. But really, they're good stuff. My next adventure uh, was with this guy. This is Chef Danny Brooks. He is a real chef. Uh, he's worked at three-star Michelin restaurants in Spain. Um, he has all kinds of horror stories from the kitchen, you guys probably can imagine. One, of, one chef he worked with uh, burned him with a pan on purpose. Like, who does that, right? <laughs> other, other bosses were very patient and kind. Um, but anyway, I, I wanted to work with Danny because now he has a regular nine-to-five job. He's married, kids, you know, just like the rest of us. And I thought, if anybody can inspire my day-to-day -day cooking, it, it's going to be Danny. But I wanted to set it up as a, like a kind of real-life experiment. So we went to the grocery store together, planned the meal, and then would bring it home and cook at home while the kids were running around and all that. So we go to the grocery store, and I'm so excited because my three-star Michelin chef is going to go to the grocery store with me, right? But, uh, and I think he's going to plan the menu, but he doesn't plan the menu. He goes into the produce section and talks to the guy in the produce section and says, hey, what should we eat tonight? I was like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. 
That's not how it's supposed to work, but it turns out the produce guy, he knows everything, right? He's tried everything in there. He has relationships with the growers. Um, if he hasn't tried it, he knows when it's come in at least, so he knows what's fresh. And he told us asparagus, green onions, avocados, they're on sale, oranges, delicious. So we're done with that. And we get home, and I learned a couple more things from Danny I wanted to share with you. So when you're doing a vegetable-forward meal, do one hot vegetable dish and one cold. And let the ingredients determine what those are. The other thing you should know about vegetables, this is Danny's advice, is you have to cook them separately. So when I grew up, you know, it was when you cooked vegetables, it was like stir-fry, just throw it all in a pot. That's not how you're supposed to cook vegetables. You're supposed to cook each one individually. Each one needs a slightly different cook time. And Danny told me this, and I thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is way too much time. But uh, the flavor convinced me otherwise. So each one we cooked individually, put it together, and they all had a slightly different texture. It was great. Um, Danny is also showing you his favorite kitchen tools, his hands. Um, his fingers have no nerve endings in them because he's <laughs> dipped in and out of so many hot pans. But don't forget your hands. They're really great kitchen tools. Um, and as far as fancy chef stuff, I would say that the fanciest thing we did was our pursuit of great ingredients. And you can do that easily at your own farmer's market where they will have the best flavors and the best prices. My last stop on this journey was to get informed, to really get up to speed on nutrition, the latest in nutrition science. And I did it with Dr. David Eisenberg. He's the Associate Professor of Nutrition at Harvard. Um, and he is a founder of something called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, which is a conference up in Napa. Um, and it's uh, not a typical medical conference. It's at the Culinary Institute of America, which is a very nice cooking school in the vineyards of Napa. And Dr. Eisenberg brings chefs and doctors together and healthcare providers. And they learn about nutrition science, share papers, but they also take cooking classes together. And they also eat together. Fascinating. It's really his ideas to sort of build on the success story of smoking cessation. So I don't know if you've seen those graphs, but at the point where doctors started to quit smoking, their patients followed suit. So the idea here is to, if you educate and, and get healthcare providers and doctors to love healthy food and know how to cook it, that maybe then they can talk to their patients a little more convincingly. And then it was Dr. Eisenberg's turn to get up on the stage. <laughs> a cooking doctor. Uh, he got up on the stage, there was a demonstration kitchen. Um, he had an apron on, and he told us a story. He told us a story about how his, father, his grandfather was a baker and how he grew up loving baked goods. And that led him on his own path towards healthy eating. And then he told us how, just like everyone else, he rushes home to cook a wholesome meal for his family. And he shared a recipe. It was a couscous salad with roasted or toasted nuts and herbs and dried fruit. And he explained how toasting the nuts release the flavor a little bit, how you have to fluff the couscous, um, how the dried fruit was just a little bit of sweetness, but didn't matter what kind of dried fruit. And he took a pan down, and he put it on the demonstration stove, and he started to cook. And I started to cry. It was, it was, I was being cared for, not treated. It was something that my mom would have done. And it was about food and cooking as self-care. And I needed to hear this message. And I needed to hear it from a doctor. And Dr. Eisenberg truly changed my life that day. So, why cook? So it turns out that people who cook fresh ingredients are healthier, okay? That is a widely accepted uh, fact um, by healthcare professionals. So 
I heard that and I thought, oh, it's got to be correlational. Like, what else are they doing? You know, are they exercising? Are they wealthier so they have more access to healthy food? What's going on? Um, but I have to say through my own journey that if you cook, you do start to do other things. I really started to care about the ingredients I was using. And if I was going to be in the kitchen, they were going to be great, fresh ingredients, and I was going to bother going to the farmer's market. I got more efficient in the kitchen and loved the creativity and fun of being in there. And seeing Dr. Eisenberg walk the walk was just that right amount of motivation for me. And to think about cooking as self-care, right? I had been told to exercise. I went and did that. I didn't outsource that. Why would I go outsource my, my, the food I was going to put in my body? So cooking does require a deeper level of engagement in how you care for yourself. And it really does matter to your family's health. Cooking makes health possible. And that's why cooking might save your life. Thank you. <laughs>